Um, so we, we're uh, trying out this new technology. It's off to a great start, isn't it? And um, I'll just tell you, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with her, her biography, it, it's a killer biography. She uh, has a PhD in general systems theory. She's an eco-philosopher, a scholar of Buddhism, a deep ecologist, a peace and justice activist. I mean, she's done this shit. I mean, you know, this is not just, she's, she's written books on every one of those subjects, good books. As a root teacher of uh, the program that she developed called The Work That Reconnects, she's created groundbreaking theoretical framework for personal and social change, as well as a powerful workshop methodology for its act application. And one of those workshops that we're going to have from 3.30 to 6.30 is exactly that work. Um, she, uh, some of her book titles, many, many, I'm not going to name them all, but uh, decades ago she, went, she wrote Despair and Personal Power in the Nuclear Age, an age we're still in, uh, Thinking Like a Mountain, um, Deep Ecology Work, Coming Back to Life, Practices that Reconnect Our Lives, Our World, that she co-wrote with Molly Young-Brown, who's here in the audience today, and, uh, and her most recent one, Active Hope how to face the mess we're in without going crazy. So uh, she's, she's saved lives, and uh, she's going to tell us uh, a, little, a few things that might help us save or at least enrich our own lives and those of others today. So please help me now welcome live from Berkeley, California, Joanna Macy. I wanted so much to be with you. This was the only way I could but I didn't know how I'd feel to appear before you with a head as big as a bus. <laughs> so, my friends, uh, I want to talk to you uh, about time. It's about time. I know that we've talked in this, and I gather that uh, Kathleen has talked about, and, and also um, Sarah, the importance of place, and the importance of naming the system that we, the political economy that we're afflicted with and conniving with. I want to talk also about time. There is a revolution in our experience of time that seems to me these days to be more and more essential uh, and attractive is what can I'm finding, uh, and we call it deep time work, we can find that we can uh, move through this apocalypse and gain a vision and a lot of company from the past and future generations when we learn how to uh, see, learn how to see what our political economy is doing to our experience of time and how our survival, indeed the survival of complex life forms, requires a new way of experiencing time, experiencing it in a fuller and saner fashion. So I'd like to take a look first at uh, what has been afflicting us uh, by our political economy. And I've been interested in the discussion here about how to categorize the political economy that we're uh, afflicted with. Uh, and uh, I, too, have been using the term uh, capitalism, late-stage capitalism, but I am also aware that uh, of what uh, similar as uh, what has how Soviet uh, socialism has afflicted the uh, natural world and the humans in their domain uh, just as ferociously. So uh, in my work, I have been using the term uh, I borrowed from great deep ecologist Norwegian. Sigmund Kvaloy and calling this the industrial growth society. It's driven by the power of industry and the key operative term is that it sets its goals and 
uh, evaluates its success in terms of how fast it can grow. And of course, uh, in our culture now, uh, that is growth in corporate profits. And that's been especially fierce since the Supreme Court decision a couple of years back of Citizens United. So what has this, we have to keep growing and how do we grow? Oh, we grow by taking the body of earth, digging it up, turning it into goods, products, energy, and weapons, and then dumping the waste on it as well. And so this is a system, uh, isn't it, that is devouring itself. And I like David Corton's term uh, that I picked up. They called it a suicide economy, an economy that is uh, fated to devour itself. And the way it treats the world, our earth, just is so, it's so poignant to me that through uh, science and spirituality in our lives, we are coming to recognize that the earth is a living system. The earth indeed alive. And therefore, since we are fully dependent upon it, a sacred living body, and it is just when we are returning to an apprehension that our uh, ancestors and our indigenous, still indigenous brothers and sisters share of this being a sacred larger body of ours, we are discovering ourselves chained to a political economy that is turning this earth into uh, treating it as a supply house and a sewer. And it has done that to the point where in our lifetime we are seeing that we have had an effect upon this living body, upon its waters and air, its soil, the cycles of uh, on which life depends that will last forever. That our karma, which really means the consequences of our actions, last forever. Now, isn't that true of the creation of fissile materials for nuclear power generation and nuclear bomb making? Isn't that true of the uh, hydraulic fracking, that we have the nerve, the gall, to be injecting into the underground waters of our planet. Mm -hmm. Chemicals can, can never, ever be separated. Mm -hmm. Isn't that true of the what we're tampering with, the genetic structure mm -hmm. of living organisms, of seeds, of bodies, claiming to own them? Mm -hmm. And it's a hit or miss proposition. You know that. That's part of what you all live with. I, when I, it dawned on me uh, how I had, I'd had the thought, you know, that when we come to a realization that our karma will last forever, we can never undo the consequences of actions we take, often under pressure, bureaucratic pressure, profit pressure, to just earn a living, to just make enough money to feed your kids. Those questions, are we, we take actions that can never be undone. And I thought, oh, this will change. Cannot this change transform, indeed, our relationship to space-time? Well, I still think it can, but we have to choose to make it so. I want us, I want to help us and myself and those people I work with and my friends think together how this horror can help us change our relationship to space time and especially to time. So let's look at what the industrial growth society 
uh, does to uh, our experience of time. Oh, I look at the watch. Oh, let's see, it's 12. Oh, I gotta hurry. I may not complete what I have to say. I have been hurrying. Oh, and there's someone in here. We are accustomed to time pressure. Time for us gets fragmented. We are in a hurry. Our bodies suffer hurry sickness. Our minds, our gestures, our actions suffer constant compression, time squeeze, and pressure in deciding and needing to multitask. We are pressured, and this experience of time, I just ask you, because I want to show you how we can uh, correct for it, but first let's look at how, uh, what it's doing to us. It is both speeding us up. Now, what is speeding us up? What is accelerating the time in which we're living? Well, technology, of course, and the drive for making it more efficient is a drive to speed it up. Constant miniaturization and we're so that we're hardly ever now out of reach of somebody being able to uh, reach us we can and, and in a hurry and having to do several things at once. And even scheduling up the kazoo, even our children are scheduled in ways, where was our free time? Where is the childhood without the being able to ramble out and get in trouble or fantasize or whatever? And what is technology? And of course, it is the market forces driving us to ever shorter term thinking so that we can maximize profits in this quarter compared to last quarter And there's hardly time to take in what we're doing. Hardly time to, it's, it's hard to take in because we haven't the time and it's also too awful to take in. So I have very much appreciated, you know, I had a chance to listen to the panel just now and I so appreciated the wisdom being shared about how to be with our grief. It's so important that we even hear people saying the word grief, to hear people say that it's natural because, and that in itself, haha, <laughs> that is subversive to even say that it's natural or wholesome or healthy to experience grief, to experience indeed, to experience outrage and to experience dread, and to experience overwhelm by what uh, is happening to our earth, and to our lives, and to each other, and to the cultures. So it is a beautiful and, and revolutionary act, is it not, to turn, as we did her just now on the panel, and bow to the fact that our hearts can break. And it is indeed our birthright to be able to uh, feel grief for what we are losing. And oh, are we losing so much. I see my grandchildren playing with things that or stuffed toys, my grandchildren are already too old for stuffed toys, but how did it feel? I bet you some of you watch children with their coloring books of animals and their stuffed toys of animals that won't be there for them when they're our age, when they're, as they're growing up. Everywhere we turn, we're reminded of some irony and some viciousness of the trick of life that we are here to see such a major disappearance mm -hmm. of life energy and life forms. But the fact that we're a great gain here is that we can see that this is not a weakness to feel grief. That is what 
the industrial growth society, mainstream culture, late stage capitalism, whatever you want to call it, is counting on. They want us not only to privatize the commons, they want us to privatize our grief. Mm. So that we think that it's because we're so sensitive or slightly neurotic or abused in our childhood or that there's some personal question of some personal pathology that is causing us to feel such doom and gloom. But instead, when we are capable of speaking what breaks our hearts. Oh, we need that. Just as Kathleen said, with a loss and a death, we come together. We talk about what we love. Do you see how politically subversive that is? Already, you are pulling out a major pillar of late stage capitalism, I would say. But then what we find is that this grief does not it's not some personal craziness, but it's our connectivity. It's because we belong. We don't weep for the polar bears or the elephants or the fields or the forests that are being cut uh, because uh, of uh, guilt. Yes, that's true, but certainly because of a deep sense of belonging of the, their right to be here, a relishing of the wisdom and beauty that they represented to us. Mm. So when we feel our sorrow and our outrage, I want to let, put the anger in there too. And anger isn't just a dangerous uh, stuffing of our grief. It is a good passion. It's a passion for life and for justice, I would say. And then we reconnect and we find our reconnection with ourselves and with each other and with time. So now let me turn to time. We've been so fragmented and so hurried and so pressured. I bet a lot of us really felt that even getting here to this wonderful symposium and in our daily lives. And I like the term to re-inhabit time. And that is our birthright too, as this species on earth among other beautiful species. To feel and enjoy the time that we represent, the time that has brought us forth. Now this isn't just about slowing down, my friends. Because you can't, it's not going to work if we just slow down. We have to open up. We have to encourage and create a larger temporal. Now, you can't see me because you're looking at my head, but I'm waving my arms. If I were with the pulpit, you'd see me holding my arms. Why? Because we want to embrace the past generations. And we want to open to the future generations. And in so doing, we can find, as we invite them into our awareness, that our lives themselves take on power and richness and scope. Now, who can, from whom can we learn for this? Oh, so many. We can learn from those still indigenous people among us. For me, coming from New York State, it's from the Haudenosaunee Six Nation Confederacy and their uh, honoring of the uh, gratitude for the ancestors and the teachers and also making room for the future as well and bringing the seventh generation into every decision. You know that. And also in this time, we have so much help to re-inhabit time, thanks to the new cosmologists or geologists, as why well, was a geologian, as Thomas Berry called himself. Oh, 
those brave minds, Thomas Berry, Brian Swim, Sister Miriam McGillis, and others, who help us claim our story and see that our roots go back, back through the millennia in an unbroken series of unfoldings and adventures, and that this can be our story and to give us a sense of uh, dignity and indeed authority and learning from them, which is always a lesson that refreshes my soul. I learn that I can be a quite uppity person, uh, speak with authority. I can learn to act my age. And, to, and so can we all, so that we can go into the offices of the uh, universities to demand divestment in the fossil fuels. We can go into the offices of the lawmakers and we can go in the full authority of our true age. Four billion years. Or if you actually to follow the universe story of Thomas Berry, I think we're 13.7 billion years old. Is that not so? I've also drawn a lot of encouragement and inspiration from some Buddha teachers, great thinkers and practitioners from the Mahayana Buddhist tradition. From Zen Master Dogen, calling us time being. We are beings of time. We are made of time. And I'm, it's wonderful to see that in the Shoto Jimsu and his sermons, they're coming back right now into greater public awareness, This his sermon particularly on time being. And that it is, we are creatures of time, not outside of time. And being, having the flow of time from the origins of uh, existence itself, uh, that hurry makes it about as much sense as if we were trying to, um, or it makes us feel like frenzied insects, uh, or um, accelerated, uh, no, I can't quite make that, but, but it, with Dogen, who inspires that, also then, even before that, uh, there is in Hua Yan Buddhism, the Avatamsaka Sutra, there is uh, the presentation of the universe, the how the Bodhisattva, now the Bodhisattva is a name for that person inside each of us who understands our deep interconnectivity. That gives the lie to our separateness. Swings open the gates for us to experience our non-separate that helps us to realize that there is nothing that can ever happen to us that would ever separate us from the sacred living body of earth because that is what we are. And in the current of time that our planet is too. And in the scriptures, the Bodhisattva sees the universe in a holographic way. Very much like contemporary science holography with the thought of Carl Prebrum and David Bohm, where you can enter one part and see and, and see the whole. Did I hurt anything? No. Can you still hear me? Wave. I can't see them. Oh, good. All right, good. I'm still. I just hit something. So in the scripture it says the, uh, the Bodhisattva can enter one moment, this moment, and 
come out in all the three times. Enter the three times and bring them into one moment. That seems very relevant to us as we uh, experience connecting with our uh, past and future generations. And I would, I'm really glad that you are going to be going into uh, a workshop, some of you who will choose to do that or can fit into that, where uh, some of Barbara Ford, is, well, if she's theirs, I think she is, will share some of our deep time practices. But I'll say a word about them. This is a way that we can begin to exercise and train our moral imagination to widen our temporal context, to enlarge our experience of time. And that is, as I said, I've, I've come to you, that is our birthright. Who in this room, who in this world has not been fashioned for this moment from a series of conditions and ancestors that reach back, back through time. And we have brought to this moment with all its dangers, all its heartbreak, and all its opportunities shaped by each of the adventures and conditions that have preceded us some way beyond our kin. So here's a practice. Take your hand. Not me, each of you. I want you to use your hand, ask permission of yourself to let yourself view your hand as a meditation object. It's very interesting to do this if you take the hand of your next door neighbor there, you're at the next seat, you can do that, you can look at his hand or let her use your hand, but at any rate, let's slow our breathing for a moment and let us, let us behold this hand. Let us, let us feel it. You know, you could be anywhere in outer space and if you were to grasp this and feel this object, it's alive, you know, you would know you were home because it's only made on planet Earth. And as I said, it's taken some four million, billion years to shape this. Oh, see how delicately hinged all those little bones are. And see how naked and soft is, as the skin of palm and, and fingertips. The protective shell has long since dropped away. This hand is so shaped as to be able to know its world to feel its textures. And our world has been known in a unique way by this hand, which is unlike any other. And it's, let's take a deep time look at this hand. As if in our mind we had some time lapse photography. Looking back through time, what can we see? Well, working way back, we could see that there's not an atom in any molecule in us, every cell of this end that doesn't go back right to the first formation of the galaxies. And then just a little ways back to the time of the great rains upon the molten 
core of this planet and then the filling of the, the carving of the continents and filling of the oceans by the rains and back to those primordial seas. This hand was there. You know, this hand was a thin once, they say, in those mother seas where life took form. And every adventure that followed on that shaped that hand in an unbroken sequence. The pushing up on dry land, the learning to reach, to grasp, to climb. Oh, look at, see, see how the thumb touches the fingers. Now that was an accomplishment. That hole there is just about the right size to grasp a branch strong enough to hold your weight. And we can thank grandmother and grandfather monkey for that. So we hold their wisdom in us, in our bodies, too, and their discoveries and their cleverness. And this hand shaped by chipping rocks and stones into tools and weapons, shaped by taking the reeds and weaving them into baskets, shaped by picking seeds and planting them and gathering the fruit in our baskets shaped by turning the reeds into flutes. That's all in those hands. We will learn to see and experience that so that time can go on on our planet. We will learn to look at our hands and see the human ancestors. Learn to see the shipbuilders and the granary fillers and the creation of Stradivarius violins and open heart surgery as well as weapons of mass destruction. This journey has brought us here and it does not bring us newly created but out of that rich tradition, journey, and we can feel the authority and, and versatility and determination that that can bring us. So we learn to bring in the ancestors in a way like that. That's one practice. And the good thing about using a part of your own body is you can do it anywhere. You can do it in the movies, you can do it on the bus, you can do it walking down the street, you can do it. <laughs> All right. And then, uh, but the future. Now, a teacher for me in recognizing the presence of the future beings in my life is Sister Rosalie Bertel. Rosalie Bertel is a... a None passed a year and a half ago, but she was one of the greatest radiologists known. A marvelous scientist on the effects of ionizing radiation from nuclear power plants and weapons <clears throat> and weapons manufacturing. And she could detect what it was doing to us even without an accident, how the closer you get to the creation of working with radioactive materials. The greater the rate of miscarriages and birth defects and stillbirths and solid cancers and leukemia. And she was an expert witness at many of a trial of us <laughs> nuclear activists. But her greatest gift to me was an offhand remark she made once. She had this to say. Every being who will ever live on earth is here today. 
where? In our gonads and in our ovaries and in our DNA. And in the decisions that we make today, often under pressure, as I've said, of efficiency and profit and just getting the job done when time is accelerated. So those decisions we make right now under the gun have everything to do with whether those future ones can be born sound of mind and body. Well, that can be a pretty horrible weight on our souls, but I tell you that it doesn't need to be. That in the process, deep time processes where we speak on their behalf in our workshops, in our classrooms, we find that uh, the future ones can be here, can be here not pointing an accusatory finger at all. When we give them a chance to speak, through us, that is. What they want is they bring us perspective. They bring us a quality of support and counsel. That's my experience. So we bring them in, you know. Uh, they named for us. When we talk like that, they bring us perspectives. It was I learned about the great turning from hearing the future ones talk back to us. Just, <clears throat> just seven generations from now, even a century from now, imagining what them, borrowing their eyes and looking back, we can do that. You are equipped with that kind of moral imagination and you better exercise it. You can imagine yourself into the future and look back at our time. One of the ways that we do that is real easy. You don't need to be, you can be anywhere at home. You could don't need to be in a workshop in our class or study group. You can write a letter to yourself. You imagine yourself into the future. Now for that, you have to just grant for that exercise that you, the assumption that there will be humans a century from now or two. So I ask you to do that. So sometimes you decided, oh, there's no chance for that. But just for that exercise and then you enter that future being, you look back, oh, you look back at yourself with tenderness. Now that's usually not part, not part of my instruction, but tenderness comes up because you know how much you try. You know how much you're working. You know how much you care. And so that future one knows too. And we'll write a letter. And that letter, and then you better keep that letter because in the days ahead, that provides a lot of useful direction. Because you see, our intelligence, our moral intelligence is so much bigger than the tiny little fragmented uh, momentariness that we are condemned to in our time experience in the industrial growth society. So you yeah. One day, I got to tell you, my colleague, uh, John Seed, was there. You know, he and I created the Council of All Beings, uh, which, uh, and how many have you ever been in the Council of All Beings? Oh, I see a hand or two. Good. Well, I went back and I said, we're going to do a laboratory or laboratory uh, for a week on deep time. And we invented practices to help us expand the context of our time that we uh, experience, to include past and future. We had a wonderful time. Well, we cried a lot, of course. That's, tears are excellent for your creativity. And I remember then, we were near the shore and we went down to swim at the beach 
and we were going running into the waves and John C. said, oh, you know what I feel like? You know when little kids go to the beach and run into the water and they've got a parent on each side and their, their parents swing them up, swing them into the waves. And he said, I feel I'm being swung into the waves by the ancestors and the future generations. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's a that's a, a, a metaphor that can become an actual experience of how the past generations in us give us strength and the future generations give us meaning and both give us inspiration. And you know that that's, they're just wonderful to hang out with. Now I'm about to close because I don't want to get in the way of your going to this workshop. But let me say this, that when we expand our temporal context, we experience what's meaningful for us as larger than our lifetimes. If you measure our lifetime from our death to our, and from our birth to our death, because you know <laughs> that it took, it took quite a long, many generations to build this late stage capitalism. It's not going to roll over dead because you want it to. It takes a while. So this is your time frame. It goes beyond your death. Well, when that happens, you realize that you're no longer dependent on seeing the results of your own actions. Because you can't. Because you're acting for something beyond, bigger than your life. That's amazing. See how liberating that is? Actually, I think of that as a kind of poor man's enlightenment. That you can be liberated out of constantly taking your pulse as to how am I doing, how effective I am. It doesn't matter how effective you think you are. You're the last person to know that. Mm -hmm. But when you give your intention, that's what can move in then. It's what in Buddhism we call bodhicitta. That's the intention for the welfare of all. The intention for life to go on on our planet. You, can, you, you want that with all the passion. And your ancestors help you want that. And your wounds and hardships help you want that. And your joys and appetites help you want that. Everything conspires to support that bodhicitta. And that liberates you. So I close uh, with um, wishing you vast enjoyment with the future ones and the ancestors, that you may feel them. They I have come convinced that there is a realm of experience. There is a realm, a level of time beyond the merely clock time, chronology time, that they want to help us. They want to reach back because the, the chain of life was just kind of thready in our times. Excuse me, I'm crying a little bit, which is always a good thing. It's good for your health. They want to help us. You can feel that. But they only have our hands. They only have our voice. And that's what you're going to do. And that's what I'm doing. Going to, learning to is that we're going to give our hands and our brains and our voice and our wits and our smarts and our sense of humor and our buoyancy and our resilience and our resistance for the sake of life with the help of all the ancestors and the future beings too. And once you make that choice, you'll find them right at your side. They're there. Just you wait. Thank you.
for listening.